Determine the critical points of the graph of each function to the nearest tenth. Then determine the nature of the critical points. So the nature would be, is it a minimum, a maximum, an inflection point? So to do this, we're going to have to find the derivative to find critical values. So f prime of x equals 3x squared minus 4x minus 35. We then set it equal to 0. And we first try to factor. You multiply 3 times negative 35, you get 105 negative. You need two numbers that multiply to get 105 negative. The same two numbers add to get negative 4. No numbers, no integers exist, so it doesn't factor. If it doesn't factor, then your choices are to complete the square or to use the quadratic formula. As you've noticed, completing the square is difficult if your lead coefficient is not a 1. So let's find the discriminant and then use the quadratic formula. The discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. b in this case is negative 4, a is 3, and c is negative 35. Putting all that in your calculator, you get 436. Since that is a positive number, that means there are two distinct critical values from the first derivative. To find those, take negative b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant divided by 2a. b in this case, once again, is negative 4. Negative, negative 4, plus or minus the square root of 436, divided by 2 times a, and a is 3. Simplifying this just the nubbin, we get 4 plus or minus the square root of 436. 436 is not a perfect square, so we're going to leave it as 436 divided by 6. Put this in your calculator, 4 plus the square root of 436 divided by 6, and then 4 minus 430 square root of 436 divided by 6, you get the following. You get critical values of x equals 4.1 to the nearest tenth, and negative 2.8 to the nearest tenth. So we just found two critical values from the first derivative. Next, we'll find some more critical values from the second derivative, f double prime of x, which is going to equal 6x minus 4. Set this equal to 0. Get x by itself. You get a critical value of 2 thirds. The direction said round to the nearest tenth. So I should write that as 0.7, following the directions. So now we have three different critical values. To find the critical points from those critical values, we take those critical values and plug them in to the original function, put them in ascending order from smallest to biggest. We get f of negative 2.8, f of 0.7, and f of 4.1. Using a calculator, we get 60.4, negative 25.1, and negative 108.2. Without doing any work, we know that this one is a maximum. This is the inflection point, and this is the minimum. Please allow me to explain how we know that. So the reason we know which is a minimum, which is a max, we all we have to examine is the leading term, x cubed. x cubed is the parent graph, which looks like this. 
whenever you throw in these other terms that have x's in them, it takes this and it, as if you pulled the graph apart in this direction and this direction, giving you a curve that looks like so. From left to right, we have a maximum first, then an inflection point, and then a minimum. If the lead coefficient was a negative number times x cubed, it would reflect this graph over the x-axis, and you would have a minimum first, then an inflection point, then a maximum. So, as I've said many times, when you put your critical values in ascending order from smallest to biggest, in this case, we end up with negative 2.8, 60.4. You don't need to show this work. I'm just trying to explain it to you. And the critical value, 0.7, negative 25.1 is an inflection point, and then the minimum is 4.1, negative 108.2. So just looking at this parent, or looking at the original equation, it tells you which critical value is going to be your minimum, maximum, and inflection point. If that doesn't make any sense to you, please let me know tomorrow and I will try to explain it to you again. Determine the critical points of the graph of each function to the nearest tenth, that's one decimal place, and determine the nature of the critical points. Nature meaning, is it a minimum, maximum, or inflection point? Before we even do this problem, looking right here at the lead, the lead term, x cubed, that tells us the graph is going to look like this. If there's three critical points, it's going to look like that. If there's one critical point, it's going to look like this. So if there's one critical point, the only critical point is going to be an inflection point. If there's three critical points, then it's going to be a maximum, followed by an inflection point, followed by a minimum. We know all of that just by looking at the beginning of this problem, the first term, x cubed. So to determine the critical values, we are going to find the first derivative is going to be 3x squared minus 18x plus 23. See if it's factors. We need two numbers that multiply to get 3 times 23. That would be 69. Same two numbers add to get negative 18. No such numbers exist. I am requiring you to do factoring first. If factoring doesn't work, then you can move on to completing the square or using the quadratic formula. If factoring does work and you choose not to do it, you will, you will not be scored as highly as someone who does do the factoring. So it doesn't factor. So let's use the quadratic formula since the lead term is not a 1. Pardon me, since the lead coefficient is not a 1, quadratic formula is probably going to be the easiest way to pursue this. Let's first find the discriminant. The reason we would do this first, if the discriminant ends up being negative, and that means this has no real critical values from the first derivative, and we can stop this madness. Discriminant's 48, which means there's going to be two critical values from the first derivative. So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant over 2a. Our b is negative 18. Discriminant's 48. a is 3. It's going to give us 18. 48 is not a perfect square, so I'm just going to leave it as a square root of 48 divided by 6. If I put into my calculator 18 plus the square root of 48, then divide it by 6, going to get 4.2 to the nearest tenth. If I put an 18 minus the square root of 48, and then that whole thing divided by 6, I'm going to get 1.8. So from the first derivative, I got critical values of 4.2 and 1.8. We can find more critical values from the second derivative. It's the derivative of the derivative. In solving this equation, we're going to see that we get a critical value of 
3. To figure out what the critical points are, the y values of the critical points, we take these critical values and put them into the original function, putting them in ascending order from smallest critical value to largest. And a calculator f of 1.8 is about 3.1, f of 3 is 0, and 4.2 is negative 3.1. Once again, going with the logic that we see up here, our first critical value is going to be a maximum, our second one is going to be an inflection point, and our third one is going to be a minimum. So that's at 1.8, 3.1, 3.0, Four point two negative three point one. That is our answer. Number twelve. Consider the functions f of x is x squared minus three x minus fifty four, and g of x fifty four plus three x minus x squared. These two functions are different in that the signs are different. All the other values are the same. So the directions are to determine the zeros of each function. So let's do f of x first. To find the zeros, you put zero. Zeros means x-intercepts, roots. Put zero in for f of x. Try to factor it. Since the lead coefficient is 1, we can use the easy method of factoring a trinomial. Two things that multiply to get negative 54 and add to get negative 3. Whatever those two things are, you can put them right into your binomials that you're multiplying. Those happen to be a negative 9 and a positive 6. Once it's factored, you set each factor equal to 0. I should mention, if you choose to split the middle term here and factor by grouping, you're going to get the same answer. So you can do that if you like. we end up with x-intercepts of 9 and negative 6. For g of x, which I'm going to put the terms in descending order, negative x squared plus 3x plus 54, to find its zeros or roots or x-intercepts, which all mean the same thing, replace g with 0. And we factor this. Please note, typically we don't like our lead coefficient to be negative. So if we find the GCF of negative 1, that changes this to x squared minus 3x minus 54. Now this trinomial is the same as g of x, which then factors the same way. Set each factor equal to 0. 0 equals negative 1. No, it doesn't. That makes no sense. 0 equals x minus 9. And 0 equals x plus 6. So you, what you'll find here is your roots, your x-intercepts, your zeros, are the same for both of these functions, even though they're different functions. They're both 9 and negative 6. Part B of this problem says sketch a graph of each function. So for f of x, let's find the derivative so we can find the critical value. We know by looking at f of x, it's going to be a parabola that opens up. It's going to have a minimum because it's positive x squared. We set it equal to 0. Let's solve it. We get a critical value of 3 halves. should mark what I'm doing here. I'm trying to find the critical value. To find the critical point, take that critical value and put it into the function. I end up with negative 56.25, which once again we know is a minimum. So graphing this,
we have a minimum at 3 halves, negative 56.25, x-intercepts of 9, and negative 6. If you look, the y-intercept for this is going to be negative 54. should mark that. should show the work for that as well, so let me do that real quick. To find the y-intercept, you replace all the x's with 0. So then let's look at g of x. Looking at the leading term, it's negative x squared. This is going to be a parabola that opens down. It's going to have a maximum. So let's find the critical value. Let's take the first derivative, which is going to be negative 2x plus 3. Set it equal to 0. Let's solve it and we get positive 3 halves is a critical value. To find the critical point, we take that critical value and put it into the original function g, and you will find that the y value is positive 56.25. Once again, we know it's a maximum. should find the y-intercept, if I can squeeze in the work here. To find the y-intercept, replace all the x values with 0. So it's going to be 54. I don't have much space, I apologize. Plus 3 times 0 minus 0 squared, which is going to be 54. Your graph, then. parabola whose maximum is 3 halves positive 56.25 once again we already found the x-intercept was 9 0 and the other x-intercept was negative 6 0 we just found the y-intercept of 54 so looking at these two graphs, the next part says, write a paragraph comparing and contrasting the two graphs. Well, I'm just going to tell you what that is right now. How are these graphs alike? Well, they're both parabolas. They both have the same x-intercepts, negative 6, 9, negative 6, 9. They both have the same absolute value for the maximums and for the y-intercepts. But what's different the y-intercept for the first graph is negative 54, and the second graph is positive. The minimum of the first graph has the same values of the maximum of the second graph, only the first one, the y-value is negative, and the second one, the y-value is positive. To sum up all of that, these two graphs are the same, only they are symmetric with respect to the x-axis. They're mere images of each other. So say some version of all that, and uh, that is the answer to part C. Use the calc and zero commands to graph each function and determine the x-intercepts. State the x-min, x-max, y-min, and y-max of the window that shows the x and y-intercepts. For this particular graph, the window that I chose to graph this on was negative 30, positive 30, then for the y's, negative 800, positive 800. This is not the only viewing window that would work. It's just what I happen to choose. And I didn't choose it just by looking at the equation. I looked at the original graph from the, the original window and then just kept playing with it until I got something that seemed like it would work well. Asking my calculator for my roots, I got negative 25 and positive 28. If you don't understand how to do this with the calculator, please let me know, and I will be glad to show you. The length of Mary Adams' rectangular flower garden is six feet more than its width. 
Let's start with that. Here's the garden. It's rectangular. We have a width. Let's say that the width is W. And I wrote width strange there. Width is W. It says that the length is six more. So that six more means plus. So the length is six more than the width. So the length is whatever the width is, but six more. Like so. Actually, I'm going to put this W inside here instead of there. You'll see why here shortly. Then it says... A walkway three feet wide surrounds the outside of the garden. So every place around this garden is a walkway. And it says that this walkway is three feet wide all the way around. The total area of the walkway itself is 288 square feet. Hmm. That's strange. Area of walkway, 288 square feet. The walkway is referring to this part. So that blue shaded area is 288 square feet. Find the dimensions of the garden. Well, check this out. Hopefully you would agree that the area of the walkway could be found by taking the area of the big rectangle minus the area of the small rectangle. This big rectangle, its dimensions from here to here is 3. From here to here is w plus 6. So that means 3 plus w plus 6 is w plus 9. Over here, there's 3 more. 9 plus 3 is 12. So this is w plus 12. Other dimension of this big rectangle. It's 3 from here to here, plus w plus 3. 3, w, 3. That makes this w plus... probably shouldn't write my w like that. It makes it w plus 6. Two threes in the w. So the area of the big rectangle, w plus 12 times w plus 6. The small rectangle, the garden, if you will, is w plus 6 times w. This area, according to the problem, the walkway, is 288 square feet. So here's our equation. If we multiply these two binomials using the FOIL method, we end up with w squared plus 18w plus 72. If we distribute this minus w times the parentheses, we get minus w squared minus 6w. Fortunately for us, combining like terms, w squared and minus w squared cancel. 18w minus 6w is 12w. Bring down 72. If you subtract 72 from both sides, you get 216 equals 12w. Then divide both sides by 12, and you get w is 18. We define w as the width. And then we said up here that the length was 6 more than that. That makes it 24. So our answer the width is 18 feet and the length 
is 24 feet. My handwriting is amazing. When an object is projected upward, its height in feet above the ground is d of t. d of t is height in feet. Is given by the function of time, t, in seconds. t is seconds. By this formula, d of t equals v sub 0, or v naught, if you will, times t minus 1 half g t squared. The acceleration due to gravity, g, is 32 feet per second. So I can replace here this g with 32 feet per second. If Travis Hafner of the Cleveland Indians hits a ball straight upward with an initial velocity v, sub zero, or v naught, of 80 feet per second, replace v with 80 feet per second. Determine the time that the ball is in the air. So, hopefully you'll agree. If this is the ground, and this person is hitting the ball with their baseball bat, that's my baseball bat slash chainsaw, and the ball goes up in the air, and then it comes back down. So, determine the time that the ball was in the air. Hopefully you'll agree that when the ball was first hit, at the instant it's hit, assuming that this person's hitting a really low ball, the height of the ball is at zero. When the ball goes up in the air, it's up one feet, two feet, three feet, 80 feet, 100 feet, and comes back down. When it hits the ground again, the height is at zero. So what we need to figure out is, at what times is the height zero? We're defining d as the height. So if I replace d with 0, and what I'm saying once again, half of 32 is 16. What we're saying is, what does t whenever the height is 0? We should get two answers for this. Logically speaking, we should get t is 0 for one of our answers. At the, that means at the time the ball was hit, the height is at 0. And then we should get another answer for t, which is, would be how long the ball's in the air. This factors. GCF is 16t, leaving us with 5 minus t. Set each factor equal to 0. And you end up with t is 0 and t is 5. The t equals 0 is what we expected. At time 0, the ball's height is 0. And then now we're saying 5 seconds later, the ball would have a height of 0 because it returns to the ground. So sentence answer, the ball, um, it will take, let's look at the question. Determine the time the ball is in the air. The ball is in the air for 5 seconds, sentence answer. The distance d sub t, followed by a free-falling body, can be represented by this formula. So d of t is distance where v naught is the initial velocity and g represents the acceleration due to gravity. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. Let's write this formula down. T of t is v naught times t minus one half g t squared, and then it says the acceleration due to gravity is nine point eight. I can replace g with that. If a rock is thrown downward with an initial velocity of four meters per second. Replace v naught with 4 from the edge of the north rim of the Grand Canyon. 
which is 1,750 meters deep. Let's examine that for a second. 1,750 meters deep. It doesn't say tall. If it said it's 1,750 meters high, we would use a positive 1,750. Since it says 1,750 meters deep, that means we're going to use a negative 1,750. Determine how long it will take for the rock to reach the bottom of the canyon. So, here's our equation. We want to add 1,750 to both sides. Also, we want to combine this, simplify this, a negative one-half times 9.8 would be negative 4.9, and then plus 4t, and then plus 1750. We had 1750 to both sides. If we want a lead coefficient to be positive, we could multiply both sides by negative 1, which gives us that, if we were graphing this, we would not do that. But we're not graphing, we're just trying to find the value of t. This does not factor using integers, so if we use the quadratic formula, we find the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac, b is negative 4, a is 4.9, C is negative 1750. Throwing this in your calculator, it ends up being 34,316, which means there's two solutions to this that are real numbers. Continuing with the quadratic formula, it's negative B plus or minus the square root of the discriminant divided by 2a, b is negative 4 of the discriminant, 34,316, a is 4.9. Simplifying this, just a nubbin. We get 4 plus or minus the square root of this hot mess divided by 9.8. You put that in your calculator. We don't want to round until we get to the end here. I'm going to get two versions of the truth. Negative 18.5 and 19.3. Think about this logically. Question says, how long did it take the rock to reach the bottom of the Grand Canyon? Our choices are, it hit 18 and a half seconds before we dropped it. Not likely. It hit 19.3 seconds after we dropped it. Very likely. Sentence answer. It would take the rock 19.3 seconds to hit the bottom. End scene.